Hello, my name is Ken Kramer and I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And today uh, I have the pleasure of interviewing Joseph Shermer. This is December the 6th, 2006 and we're at the Madera Branch Library. Our camera operator today is Robin Warner. Uh, and I certainly want to welcome you today and I thank you for coming. Um, very eager to hear your story um, as a World War II veteran. So I'd like to ask you to perhaps start uh, just before you entered service and what you were doing. And were, you, were you drafted or did you enlist or you know, kind of start there? Okay, I was an auto automobile mechanic. Uh, I had gone to uh, automotive high school. I took a four-year course in two years. It was during the Depression time, so we went all year round. And uh, so I started out working in an automotive business at the age of 16. And uh, my first job paid six dollars a week, a dollar a day. It was for a 10-hour day, it was 10 cents an hour. And uh, of course I got a lot of experience there. And uh, after about a year, well, the gentleman raised me to nine dollars an hour. And uh, then I changed jobs and to another location. I went to Glendale Motors in Glendale, Ohio. And uh, for a Dodge and Plymouth dealer, and uh, they paid me eighteen dollars an hour, so that was a good raise. Although it took a you lot. You mean a more. week? Eighteen dollars. Eighteen dollars a week. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry. To that. But anyway, uh, I had automotive training, and uh, I was drafted, and uh, I was uh, about the last mechanic left in Glendale. So the mayor of Glendale uh, got me a deferment. Hmm. And uh, his name was uh, James Crothers, and he was on the Wyoming Draft Board, Wyoming, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, th at that time, they drafted you from where you worked rather than from where you lived. Now, of course, if you lived where you worked in that area, well, it, yeah. it, uh, that's where he's drafted from. So I, I was a six-month deferment, and uh, of course, we worked on a police car and the boys' vehicles, plus the other people's cars, doctors, and so on and the regular customers that could uh, get enough uh, stamps to drive enough. We got, we, an average person got three, sta three stamps a week for 15 gallon gas at that time. Anyway, then the second time come around, he got me another deferment. Cool. And uh, the third time he came to me, I said, no, I'm going to go into service. I'm not going to sit here for the whole war, you know. And, and uh, that, so I went down to the draft board and uh, registered that I was, you know, was going to go on in. And then I went for my medical and I failed the medical. My eyes were so bad that they said they could not use me. And uh, then they just looked over the records and they said, yeah, I was in the automotive business uh, working. So then they gave me a test on that, which I passed. And they sent me up to Aberdeen Proving Ground because that's where they needed people. They so decided they could use you after all. After all, yes. <laughs> So I went through basic training at Aber Aberdeen and I took technical training, which uh, supplemented my training I had in civilian life. And uh, after taking a course in that... We're, we're talking about uh, August of 1943. August 1943 and uh, basic training, technical training, and then they made me an instructor in the Ordnance School mm. in the Automotive Track and Road Vehicle Electrical Section. Say that again, the automotive? Automotive, road. track, and real world vehicle. Work, work, track and what? Real, W-H-E-E-L. Real. Okay. Real vehicles. Okay. In the electrical section. And that meant it covered all the vehicles. Everything that run on tracks are real vehicles. Okay. So uh, I became an instructor there. And uh, for the first uh, couple of weeks, I was under the supervision of uh, an experienced instructor. and. Uh, then uh, I was on my own basically, and I started out in the first week instructing and instructed through the whole course every week over a period of time until I got to the eighth week and I stayed there for the rest of my duration at Aberdeen. What were some of the, can you, can you name some of the vehicles uh, uh, that you trained people on? We, we trained from the Jeep, mm -hmm. to the bomb, uh, bomb service trucks, uh, <coughs> The biggest one I trained on was the Sherman M4 tank. Mm -hmm. I had three of those that I taught on. And they also had the motor carriages and the M5A1 white tank uh, we taught on. 
uh, everything was on with half tracks. Everything that was wheeled are on tracks we taught on. Did you say motor carriages? Motor carriages. What's that? That was a tra vehicle that had tracks on it, but it did not have a turret on it. It was kind of an open. It was more of a uh, vehicle that carried uh, soldiers around. Mm -hmm. and it was very lightly armored on the bottom part. And that was a motor carriage, like the M10 motor carriage would carry maybe about uh, uh, 15 people on it, plus the driver and the co-driver. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, we taught on all those vehicles, and what we did was we taught them primarily. They had a lot of training before they come to Aberdeen. And what we taught them basically is how to repair these vehicles under fire on, in the field, in, the, in emergency situations when an engine would stop running or uh, whatever, a track would come off. We had, a, it was a track, a chassis section also, which I was not in, it taught them how to to repair the tracks and put them back on and repair the running gear part of the vehicle. And then there's also, there's a section that taught them how to fire the guns and the turret traversing mechanism and so on for for firing the guns and all. So it was a complete coverage that they got there. And how many weeks was it? That was an eight week course. Eight week course. Now, okay. bear in mind that the eight week course is what we had in the track and grill vehicle electrical section, but also the chassis section had an eight week course. It depended upon what this, particular soldier happened to specialize in back at his own base. One soldier did not do the whole, everything. They had their specialties. Mm -hmm. So there would be a specialty for the gun situation and also for the motor, the, for the running gear of the vehicle and for the electrical section is what we specialized in in my particular class. Mm -hmm. And that would be the generators and starters and magnetos and uh, firing mechanisms and lighting systems and everything that pertained to electrical. So we taught. Mostly how to repair. How to repair it out in the field mm -hmm. under conditions that were not normal. Were you instrumental in, um, in recommending uh, what tools they would have with them or did you have knowledge? Yes, we, uh, <clears throat> each, each person there was supplied with a tool kit while they were there and that's what we recommend them for to get when they get back to their base. In fact, they didn't let them take that tool kit? No, they did not. Okay. They did not. And I taught from full kernels down to whack privates. It was really? In these, uh, in these classes, yes, sir. Full kernels learned how to repair? Well, they basically were standing just uh, not to learn how to repair, but how to supervise the repairs, basically, or to see okay. how, how the, basically, for knowledge to take back to how to run the class. So they, but, but I did have captains from down that we did actually take the class. So in terms of toolkits, though, it was just a like, Box of hand tools? It was or? hand tools primarily. It was electrical testing equipment mm -hmm. because that's what we specialized in. And it had all the sockets and tools that would take to like to remove the magnetos from the engine, for instance, or the carburetor off of the engine, or mm -hmm. uh, lighting system. It gave them all the hand tools that was necessary to work on the vehicles. And when I say all, oh, well, they never had enough of them, believe me. It's just, uh, they had to improvise a lot too for the tools. Can imagine. And did you hear ever hear back from the students or uh, how it went? Uh, no, I never did hear back when they went overseas. That's the last when when they left our place, they went back to their base and went overseas, and that's the last we heard of them. I had known some people that came back from overseas that I had not personally taught. In fact, the people that came back from overseas after uh, about a year and a half of my instructing there. They came back and uh, we taught them how to teach our classes and that's when I was finally shipped out of Aberdeen. And uh, uh, they was telling about their experiences and, and uh, different situations come up which actually aided us in making some recommendation, recommendations or changes. In well that's what I was wondering about. The, you know, wonder. Because the actual conditions uh, that they worked under, uh, we had not experienced that so they gave us a lot of good advice. In fact, a lot of times there was uh, people in the class, like from uh, General Motors and from uh, General Electric and a lot of big places that actually had more knowledge about the particular subject than I did. And I found out it was beneficial to uh, work them into where they was telling the class. They could explain it better than I could mm -hmm. in many cases, you know, and it was beneficial to turn the class over to them for this particular period of time. And uh, the students, uh, of course, Many of them didn't want to be in the service to begin with, but we had a program going there in the electrical section that would be beneficial back in civilian life, like we taught tune-ups, you know, and 
and uh, overhauling generators and starters, how to do that there, and uh, the things that they could use back in civilian life, where many people got training that never would never use it again. Right. For artillery would be one of them. So, so that helped uh, pique their interest, I guess. That even did keep more of them interested in it mm -hmm. because uh, the beneficial effect that they had a training that they would be able to go back and use, even if it was only on their own vehicle, their own car. Right. So that was beneficial to them. Uh, how well organized would you say the the training there was? It was very organized and very strict. Uh, we had a full work day. We was excused from guard duty and KP because we had to be in the class. So basically, we had like a, an 8 a.m. to a 5 p.m. day of teaching minus the lunch period. Uh, we still had to do our uh, fallout on Saturdays for inspection, and uh, we still had to uh, take rifle uh, training and. Uh, small arms training. In fact, uh, one of my medals there is a sharpshooter in rifle training, which I had the advantage of when I was young. We went out in the farm off and I had my own rifle and I was able to, I knew a lot about shooting before I got in. And many people that, that uh, were just not able to ever get above a marksman because, well, that was the norm was a marksman. But there was a marksman and there's sharpshooter, but then there's also the expert. And the experts are one that they usually use for sniping, and it was the top man on the lead in the when they're sniping for people in that. Well, I'm I'm just always impressed with uh, the various um, operations, wide variety of operations that it took to support the fighting itself, and how well organized. That most of the stories I've heard. Of, or about operations that were well organized. When you when you think of how uh, large a scale that had to be, that was it was really impressive. Right. We had, in fact, we had uh, two captains. It was at the uh, in doing the course, mm -hmm. and they kind of goofed off. They didn't want to clean up after the work. Every night the tools had to be put away and accounted for, and uh, they had to follow the instructions. In fact. Uh, if you look back through the records, when you're in a classroom, you got the uh, uh, what's called of a full colonel. The uh, I forget how to how to put that. The authority mm -hmm. of a full colonel in the classroom. Of course, once you got outside the door after the class that day, well, you <laughs> you lost that immediately, mm -hmm. and uh, you never never want to get into one of them people's uh, outfits uh, later on. <laughs> yeah, but these two captains, they didn't want to do the work, so. Uh, uh, our Captain Crosland that was in charge of our section, he called the Commandant of the Ordnance School who come down and told these people off and uh, one more mishap and they was going to be sent back to their base without the rest of their training and recommended to, that they would be reduced in rank. So well, they straightened up the rest of the week and swept the floor after the class and everything like the rest, but they did not want, they didn't think they needed to participate. They thought when they got out in the field that they would be doing none of this work, they'd have other people doing it. You know, they'd be doing is supervising, which is usually true. But once in a while, some of the officers did have to pitch in and help out. I mean, there's no way out of it. That's the only way they get something done. So you you have a list of uh, the people, the students, uh, they signed in once they got to your training. And it looks like a very impressive list like a lot of numbers. Do you have any idea how many? Uh, you know, I never did count them, but uh, we had them from every state in the Union and from Hawaii and uh, from Canada and uh, from, so occasionally once in a while from France or from England, Great Britain, but predominantly is from the United States uh, all, all throughout and every state was covered. And uh, the service club at Aberdeen had a book that you could sign in for every state in the Union and uh, you could go there and sign in and then you'd recognize some other names from your locality, you know, and you'd, mm -hmm. you'd try to get in touch with them. Usually you didn't because they had went on from that point or were in some training that they couldn't break loose from or something like that. And how long were you there then in Aberdeen? Aberdeen, I think it was uh, about 18 months, so I, 18 to 24, I'm not sure, I never mm -hmm. did really add it up. But I did have one occasion where 
we had we had assistant instructors too to aid us, of course. And uh, on this one occasion, they asked us uh, asked the men to volunteer for a special duty, which I did, and turned the class over to the assistant. And it wound up that we was outfitted with full Arctic clothing. I mean, the, like the Air Force used. Mm -hmm. And we wound up uh, getting on a train. We never knew where we was going, they didn't tell you. We wound up on a train and we wound up at Detroit, Michigan. And there they issued, uh, well, they didn't issue, they turned us over to vehicles uh, to drive to Bayonne, New Jersey during the Battle of the Bulge. And we made a trip there, 400 trucks we took through. And we, being from Aberdeen Proving Ground, after a while of uh, going along and the cars, trucks broke down, we would stop to help them and the officer was in charge, he was behind the whole outfit and he'd pick up the stragglers and that. And he wanted to know uh, where we was from, we told him Aberdeen, so then he put us behind the whole group. Mm -hmm. Not only our, the fellow I was driving with, but some other fellows were from Aberdeen and uh, up volunteer too. So we would stop and get the vehicles running if we could. If not, we hooked the tow bar on and towed them. And uh, we had one occasion where this was a straight through drive. There was a driver and an assistant driver in each vehicle and we would swap driving positions without stopping. And uh, these were convertible trucks. It was around January the 1st. And by convertible, I mean just convertible tops, no side doors. And it was, it was down close to zero degrees. And I seen while I issued the yard, <laughs> and the fact the first 40 mile out of uh, Detroit was on sheer ice and one man was standing on the running board, running board scraping the ice off of the windshield oh as we were driving along. But getting back to this other thing about the, uh, the, the this two drivers, at one time we stopped for a truck that was by the side of the road. There was this two and a half ton Jimmy, what we call it, it was GMC. It was a six by six uh, all, drive, all wheels driving. And he stopped there and we asked him what was wrong and he said he was too tired to drive. And we said, what about the assistant driver? He says he, he's never had a driver's license to drive an army vehicle. So they wasn't checking on everybody that was driving. So we hooked a tow bar into him and towed him maybe about 100, 150 miles and, and uh, he got a little rest. But we went over the Pennsylvania Turnpike right after it was first opened. And we stopped at uh, Indian Town Gap uh, for uh, food, and uh, which was cold sandwiches out in the cold airplane hangar, and refueled, and we got on again, and going down through West Virginia, we had 13 trucks crack up at the bottom of the hill, running into each other with sheer ice, oh my and they just couldn't control the vehicles going down there. It was 13 in one place, it was just, whereas turning the road, they just went and basically straight ahead out in this farmer's field and cracked up. We had some other ones on its way here that uh, going through a town, one of them went through a showroom window of an auto dealer, he's on ice, one of them hit a telephone pole, one of them hit a front porch of a house along the way there, and it was just a matter of backing up and going on, you never stopped there, I don't know how these, these people certainly put in uh, Claim. complaints for about it or whatever, <coughs> but uh, we lost, uh, out of the 400 trucks, I guess it was, um, Oh, maybe we lost 100, 150 trucks on the oh, way going. Goodness. So we got clear up to Bayonne, New Jersey, where it was, they were shipped out of. They sent us to Fort uh, uh, Camp Joyce Kilmer in New Jersey also. And one unusual thing we seen there was the American soldiers going around policing the area and everything, but the German prisoners there were playing basketball and that kind of stuff there, <laughs> so they had a better job than, than we did. But then we got the news that we had to go back to Detroit and bring another trip through. Mm -hmm. And that time we managed to get a hold of an ambulance which was closed, uh, closed cabs. So we were in better shape on that trip through there. Oh. So that was two trips through that. You uh, got assigned to we drive got assigned an ambulance. To drive an ambulance, yeah. Well, it wasn't being used at the time. It was going to on to, to battle the bones also. Were these trucks uh, hauling something? Or they no, just they were just be being delivered to take over there and to use during okay. the war. In other words, so many of them had been shot up and tore up and broke down and everything. They needed replacement to vehicles and uh, they put them on the boat and took them over. And, uh, what did you guys do for fuel during, for that long Fuel, trip? you carried five gallon cans on your truck that you could add fuel to. And uh, the five gallon GI cans all had a screw lid on them. And, a big spout, and you could pour it right into the gas so tank. Every truck carried its own 
carried their own fuel. Well, there's one truck primary that carried the majority of the fuel in the antifreeze. Some of them strung <coughs> leaks into the antifreeze. In fact, we really didn't have uh, permanent antifreeze till World War II when they started using ethylene glycol. Uh, before that, there it was. Uh, we always uh, used alcohol antifreeze in the winter, and you drain it out in the spring and put water in. In the fall, you drain the water out and put alcohol back in. Of course, there's a big fire hazard using alcohol in the summer months because the older cars they burn over a lot, and it was a fire hazard. But they finally came out with ethylene glycol, and that was the start of that for civilian use after the war. Okay. Where did you go then after uh, Everding? I see you here you go up because I yeah, know. we went. I went to. Uh, I got a 14-day delay en route to Indian Town Gap, so I went home, and uh, my wife, and future wife, uh, she wanted to get married, and I did not, they never told you where you were going to go. So I said no, so she said, uh, well, let's get engaged, and I loved her, so I said okay. So she knew the jeweler already and the ring she wanted. <laughs> she <laughs> was busy while you were gone. Yeah, she was. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know her mother told me later on, uh, after we were married, that Marjorie come home after our second date and uh, uh, told her mother she's going to marry me. Oh. And I met her in the strangest way. I met her in the kitchen of my own house at home when I was home on leave. My mother took care of Marjorie's aunt. Of course, I didn't know Marjorie at the time. I didn't know her aunt because we used to take her aunt to church and she was a semi-invalid. And my mother used to go over and help her all the time. And one Saturday, when she was over there helping her, Marjorie came from the, she worked a half a day on Saturday. She came from where she worked up to visit her aunt. And my mother was there, and she got introduced to her. And about the third or fourth time of meeting her there, well, she, my mother invited her over to the house sometimes when she was there. And she said, OK. So one day, she went up to visit her aunt. And uh, her aunt had been taken to the dentist. So she said, well, I live a block, I'm a block away from Mrs. Shermer, so I went over there and rang the doorbell. She did, and she, my mother brought her back in and introduced her to me, and she claims that I was tilted back on a chair, and when she came around the corner of the room, I clunked down on the chair. <laughs> and uh, she was, uh, uh, she claims I did that, I don't remember. But anyway, then she, my mother invited her to stay for supper, so after supper, I told her I had a date with another girl that I'd been going with for about two, about two years, and uh, I would drop her off at her house on the way to my date, so she went after ride a bus home. So she said, "Okay," and I took her out to her house on, in Oakley, and uh, then I went on to my date. I didn't think anything more of it, and then about two weeks later, I got a light blue envelope in the mail and uh, a letter inside of it, uh, with a nice letter from Marjorie with a little cologne on it, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, she put her phone number in there. And, so when I went home the next time on leave, I called her up and uh, she went out on a date with me and uh, she told, uh, she, her mother told me that after her second date, like I said before, that uh, she was going to marry me after two dates. Of course, we went out every day after that while I was home mm -hmm. and uh, we got to know each other a little bit. And then I had a couple more uh, before that. This here all happened not at this time. This happened before okay. and uh, it led up to this, this time here of, of being home and uh, uh, to go overseas is when she wanted to get engaged and married or married or engaged. Anyway, so I agreed to that there and uh, I left uh, and uh, to go to Indian Town Gap, which was the Elaine route, and there they put us on a train and took us to New Orleans. And we stayed at New Orleans for about a week. And from New Orleans they took us to Panama Canal. And we stayed there basically about 10 days in the, in the canal zone. And of course, there they took advantage of us being there, KP, you know, and guard duty, and there was a work. Yeah. And uh, one of the guard duties there was the worst experience of my life. Uh, I was issued uh, a 30 caliber carbine rifle, and uh, I was taken out. They loaded us all, a bunch of guys on the truck and took us out and dropped us off at different de designations. And the designation they dropped me off at was an aviation supply dump. It was completely unfenced with uh, uh, this big chain link fence. So I, they had a guard house at one end and they had a guard house at the other and you'd walk your route from one end to the other. And uh, it was daylight and uh, you had to wear a mosquito net, uh, net 
over your fat over your head, and we had gloves on and leggings and all because the mosquito situation was very bad there, and it was really hot there too. But this was basically in the jungle, mm -hmm. is what I'm talking about, <coughs> and you'd hear wild animals flashing overhead like uh, monkeys, you know, and and down there they did have the snakes, you know, the sort of slithering through and. Uh, we had uh, wild cats and cougars and all that, it was really a jungle. And I heard the stuff flashing around, so uh, it started getting dark and uh, I couldn't see very well. A uh, little Boy Scout flashlight, which was one of the right angle ones, it hardly gave a beam with the mosquito net on. So I timed how long it took to walk from one post to the other, which was 15 minutes. So I went back to the one post where he was going to pick me up and I called in every 15 minutes to tell him everything was okay. Mm -hmm. Because I was so frightened to walk through there because at night time to hear stuff thrashing overhead, you know, and mm -hmm. slithering through the bushes and everything, it was just so frightening. It, uh, it was uh, an experience. So after that period of time, well, they, uh, they still didn't tell us where we were going. Finally, they put us on a ship and took us out to these islands, and here it was the Galapagos Islands. And I thought, well, there's, what am I doing here on this island? There's no fighting going on here or anything, and that, and, and uh, we were quarantined for a while because one of the fellows on board ship got some kind of a disease, that they started, and we had to stay on the ship for about another eight or ten days. And then when we got off of the ship uh, and uh, got oriented, and I wound up in the uh, 6th Air Force, is what it was, and I, in the 2118th Air Service Unit, and I'd done down there what I'd been teaching at Aberdeen. That's how I got in the Air Force. They needed what I called a 912 spec number. I qualified for what they needed. So that's how I wound up there. So anyway... You did what? I'd done all the stuff that I taught at Aberdeen, overhauling generators. Everything was taken off the vehicles and brought into me, and I worked on the bench. Starters, generators, fuel pumps, carburetors, windshield wipers, speedometers, anything that was electrical. And uh, carburetors, of course, was electrical, but was still bench work. And this is some of the things I'd done in civilian life, too, before, of course. And then that was explained to me. I said, what am I doing here? And they explained to me that the Galapagos Islands, uh, B-24 bombers, B-17 bombers they had there first, uh, would fly round trip to Panama Canal, and they would guard the western approach to Panama Canal from anti-submarine anti patrol. Anti-submarine patrol? Yeah. Yes, submarine patrol, and they explained to me that uh, if the canal was knocked out, all the shipping would have to go around South America about 15 days longer, about 7,000 miles further, and it would really delay mm -hmm. everything would have went around the sure. South America. So that left me know that I was doing an important job at the time. For sure. And uh, we, uh, the particular barracks I was in had all the specialists in it, uh, the people that uh, the carpenter, for instance, and the electrician for the base, and the, in my position, the repair work, uh, electrical repair work, and the fellow that drove the quartermaster truck up to bring supplies up for the mess hall, and all those things were taken care of there. We had no fresh water on the island. Uh, There's an ocean-going tugboat there with a barge. We went over to another island that had plenty of full water. Our island was seven mile long and three mile wide. And there was no vegetation, there was cactus on it, period. It was a, truly a volcanic island. Mm -hmm. And the other islands were all green vegetation laws, just like a line of demarcation was across there. The other islands were all green and they had all kind of animals. Now we had, we had turtles on our island and we had iguanas and uh, all types of birds and that was on our island that could fly and get their stuff over to other islands and that. But anyway, this tar bug tugboat would every 10 days it would go over to the island and fill up the barge and bring it back for our fresh water. And we had a plumber there that uh, did the plumbing and he tapped in the fresh water line for our shower. We were the only ones that had a fresh water shower and all the rest had salt water showers. So that was a good thing too. But anyway, uh, I stayed down there for the duration of the war and then finally I accumulated enough points that uh, I had to just pull it out. I wound up as a sergeant down there. Incidentally, when I was teaching at Aberdeen, I was a private in the PFC. Mm -hmm. and it, what they have is a table of organization, a TO. And there's only so many staff sergeants, master sergeants, buck sergeants, and all the way down the line. And when those were occupied, your space is occupied, you'd never get a rating until somebody moved out. 
Okay. So we had basically everybody teaching there was a private or PFC draw on that pay instead of the my job at that time rated was should have been a staff sergeant is one they called for actually to But you were getting teach it I pay at the private, private base, yeah. So anyway, uh, then I was a uh, sergeant down there and they told me that if I stayed three more months they'd give me a rating boost uh, to a staff sergeant and a tech sergeant and a master sergeant I'd be discharged as a master sergeant by staying three more months, which of course I did not do. I wanted to get home. <laughs> so they, uh, one of the things I forget to, forgot to say about the planes, the B-17 planes would have to fly from Galapagos to the Panama Canal Zone and they'd have to refuel. So then they started using B-24s that could make a round trip without refueling. That's how I run out with B-24s at that base. They did not have to stop and refuel. But it was 24-hour day patrol, day and night. And, uh, well, they would fly out and what, just They'd fly over the ocean and fly around the whole route that anyone would take entering into the Panama Canal. So the canal mostly zone. surveillance, but surveillance, they, were, right. they were uh Able to attack if they saw something. They had bombs on board and machine guns, <coughs> and they were able to attack. There's about uh, 13 men uh, on the B-24 B that could do this. Now, bear in mind, they also had patrols going out from Panama itself, and uh, it's running. In fact, I got a list there that, of course, we won't introduce it because too much, where over 123 planes crashed down there during the war in the mountainous area of, uh, of uh, Panama. They was Hey, they land on the hillsides and mountainsides, I should say. And we had, uh, from the 6th Air Force, was up in the Isthmus of Panama, on up almost to Mexico. They had air bases and also down in South America, which people never knew about. We had air bases uh, all the way down in uh, Colombia and uh, the Uruguay and those places there had bases. And one of our big bases was in Salinas, Ecuador. These islands were owned by Ecuador, and President Roosevelt leased this one island for 99 years when the war started. That's how we got out there, that we got the island to use. But Salinas, Ecuador was a 600 mile from the Galapagos Islands. Panama was 1,080 mile. So the planes that had two engines that brought the, like the C-46 and C-47, they would fly to Salinas first and then fly from there out to, they refuel there and fly on out to Panama. And, uh, that's how we got involved with with Ecuador, and then we had Ecuadorians worked on the island too, doing the KP on the island and uh, uh, things of that nature there, uh, trash pickup, and that stuff there. They they earned like ten cents an hour. They were very happy to get it. it was more than what they would be earning back in Ecuador at that time. So how many planes again crashed? Uh, 123 is listed. I counted the numbers of crashes. They're all listed out. What the crash? Some of them from your base? Uh, yes, some of them from the base. It's got listed ones that uh, crashed. Uh, our island was separate from the other islands. Like I say, they, in fact, there was a Humboldt current come up from the South Pole. And South America juts out to, to the west at one point. This Humboldt current would follow this contour of the South America and it swung out right past the islands itself. And uh, like the hottest that got, we were four miles below the equator on our island. The hottest that got wise there was 86 and the coldest it was like 66 mm. because of the Humboldt current. Mm. It was so cold that we did not go in swimming until very late in the afternoon. They put out a shark net where we could, at one area cove like where we could swim in. But it was so cold there that we actually had penguins there and we had seals there in addition to the iguanas and the turtles, and, hmm. and the turtles were big, like they said, I could sit on one and to get up and walk away around like I wasn't even on there, you know. <laughs> and it was very interesting in that respect. The, the, uh, it was a very interesting once I knew why I was there and what was there. Uh, of course, if I had known more about the islands, they called it the rock at the time. Hmm. If I had known more about it, I could have taken a lot of trips over to the other islands and around that. Uh, when they went to get water and all, that uh, people now they pay five or six thousand dollars to go there for a trip. And yeah, that's a popular destination, travel destination. Right, and it was unlimited. Where the soldiers that did go over there could could go. Now it's limited to where you can have access to what you can have access to. So, that's it. But the um, when a plane was lost, was was that? Uh, I mean, were you made aware of that? Uh, did you? I mean, 
was the were people upset in the base? Yeah, they were. We uh, we had uh, uh, we done the work on the vehicles also that the uh, the Sixth Air Force used to, to service their planes. In other words, they had like their little mule that they pulled the planes around with on the mm -hmm. flight line. All they had a CLIA track, which was a wheel vehicle, it was like a tractor with tracks on it mm -hmm. that they used. And uh, then they had their vehicles, uh, two and a half ton jimmies, that took the, their plane uh, crew to and from their barracks to the, to the uh, flight line and so on. So uh, we found through them that uh, the ones that had gone down was missing. In fact, our captain uh, that we had later on there, he was assigned to us. Uh, he was a B-24 pilot. And he got grounded for buzzing the mess hall when the Colonel in charge of the base was in the panel. He decided to buzz the mess hall, and, <laughs> and when the colonel came back, he downgraded him to. Uh, and he loved flying; <laughs> it really hurt him. To, but he's in charge of our third echelon motor repair shop. Then from then on. Ah, very very interesting. Yeah. Uh, were the planes that went out with bombs and were they able to land then, with still carrying bombs? When when yes, they could. Uh, this, what I started to say before and I got off the track, was another island over. It was like a cliff, sharp cliff, like an isthmus in between the two islands. And they could only land one way, like I told you, the wind, the current was only one way all the time. They could only land one way coming in over that okay. isthmus. And if a bomber come in and had the two engines out, they, if they couldn't land the first time around, they went around and ditched the plane and it was picked up by an Army or Navy crash boat because they couldn't get enough altitude back up with two engines to make another attempt to land. And the same thing happened with the C-46 and C-47s. They had a point of no return from, this, from Salinas, Ecuador to the Galapagos Islands. And if they just passed the point of no return and one engine went out on them, they would proceed onto the Galapagos. If it happened before then, they'd return to Salinas. And they would fly over our base, they'd be bringing our mail and some other supplies, and they would drop, they'd fly over first to the height and drop our mail and everything and canvas bags to us. Because they too, if they come under one engine over that pass, and they, they, they couldn't land hmm. because they some malfunction or something, or they didn't time it right, they also would ditch out in the ocean to be picked up. And uh, these are, uh, we also had, uh, Navy had PBY boats there uh, that they, uh, of course, could land in the water in the oceans. And then they would, uh, two sailors would float, go out with their wheels that they had floats attached to and attach them to the plane. And then a caterpillar tracker would winch on them, would winch them up out of the water up on a landing ramp that they had. Of course, when they left to fly again, they could, their engines would pull them on down. They would take off and they run out into the ocean and two sailors would go out and take the wheels off of them. And, and then there's other ones that actually had the wheels that went up into the side of the, the plane, some of the Catalinas, but most of them, they attached the wheels and detached them. So which planes could land in the water? The Catalina flying boats they were, the PBYs. Okay. Oh, okay. They were Catalina flying but, boats. But, but, they the, were, yeah, but the, uh, the bombers and so forth, they, they, they could not. No. They, would, that would be they the had one. to land on the land. Or else, if they had to ditch, that was the end of the plane. It was the end of the plane, and uh, the, they were always able to uh, to rescue the soldiers, uh, sailors rather, uh, well, the plane aircraft men, because of the fact that they knew ahead of time that they mm -hmm. were going to have to crash land. They'd fly around. They said, "I can't get enough altitude. We're going to have to put it down." And the crash boats would go out to rescue. Them. Would they? Would the people still be in the? The plane, or would they eject? They would get. They would get out. They had the life rafts that they would dispatch, and they'd get out of the plane. And, and but they were in the plane when it hit the water. When it hit the water, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. yeah they hit the water, and uh, these uh, Catalina flying boat uh, pilots, they uh, would go out and try and take off, and they'd come back, and they'd try again. They'd have to hit the wave. Uh, the wave when it's fully loaded with bombs and uh, ammunition. They, to help them assist them take off, the way would have to be coming in at the same time they gunned their engines to get the, to get off. Otherwise, they'd have to circle around, and come back, and try again. All these things were of interest to me at the time. I bet. Well, it's interesting now too. So then, uh, from there, you were discharged. I was discharged, and they flew me back in a B-17. Mm -hmm. 
to uh, Panama Canal and then uh, boat to Merida, New Orleans and then up on the train. That's another thing, if I'd stayed for three more months, I could have flew all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> As a master sergeant, you had privileges. <laughs> yeah. There's one thing, Aaron, and I forgot to mention, I got so seasick going mm -hmm. that uh, I was down in the lower hold, they had these uh, canvas uh, uh, bunks. bunks. Well, yeah, there were canvas tied between pipes, oh. which would throw up, tied them up, and just a flat piece of canvas would. Okay. And I was down in the lower hold, and I was so sick that they had an abandoned ship drill, and I didn't move. I was just was there, and they'd come down to see who, to make sure everybody was out. And I was laying there so sick, and I, they said that you got to get. You got to get up out of here. I said, I just can't go. He said, Well, what if the ship sinks? I said, Let the damn ship sink. I mean, I was that, I felt that bad that I didn't care. Mm -hmm. So two of them drug me up on the uh, what they called the B deck, and you had a life jacket on that everybody had vomited on before you. Of course, it was tied around your neck and everything, and and uh, you was wearing that all the while. And of course, that didn't help. You that know? didn't help. <laughs> so they put me up on B deck, and uh, I was leaning against it, and after a band ship drill. And I, I slumped down right there, and that's where I stayed the rest of the trip. Right leaning against that bulkhead. I just Goodness. couldn't, I was so sick. That sounds really sick. So then you got home and got married. I got home and uh, got home February 1st at uh, discharge at Camp Atterbury. Not Camp Atterbury. We're talking 1946 now. 46 at Camp, uh, yeah, that was Atterbury. Uh, and uh, then they gave me uh, a uniform that I should have got a bigger one. They just, uh, see I had all uh, tropical clothes on when I yeah. come home. Okay. So they gave, and this was winter time, February, so they gave me OD clothes. And uh, I wish they'd give me a larger size, I could have worn them longer. <laughs> but uh, I can still get them now because I had a siege with cancer and I lost a lot of weight in there gain it back and uh, so it fits me again. That's why it fits me now. <laughs> because I got down to 145 pounds and I got back up to 160 and I've stayed there. So I, I weighed 158 when I was in the service. So, so you got married? Yeah, the, after I got out, uh, my wife uh, to be, she uh, made all the arrangements unbeknownst to me. And uh, she's very busy while she you were. She knew. Uh, <laughs> Where she could get a bridal dress after the war, that was hard to come by, you know, and she borrowed the veil from her cousin, and she found out where she could get me a suit of clothes. Back then, everybody, men all got married in their regular clothes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they were nice clothes, but you didn't go to no special means for that. And uh, we, we got married on uh, June the 5th of 1946. And uh, she even had the place where we uh, went to Clifty Falls on honeymoon. She already had that programmed. So, so I never didn't know how it happened so fast, but I found out later, and I'm so thankful she did it because it was just a great marriage of 56 years. She died three and a half years ago. Yeah. It was a sad time. Sure. Yeah. So. And you had how many kids? We had six children, five daughters and a son. The son was last. And uh, they all live in the Cincinnati area, and uh, seven grandchildren. And uh, I went back to work uh, in the automotive business, and uh, that was pretty much your career in the automotive. In the automotive business, I went back to work for a Dodge and Plymouth dealer, and then they became a Hudson dealer, and I became a service manager there. And uh, Hudson uh, and Packard merged, and then they went kaput. So I went to work for a Chinese Buick, which was a local Buick dealer over in, mm -hmm. you know, off of Vine Street. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> I worked there in the service department, and uh, Tom Jennings wanted me to become the service manager, and the mechanics were earning more than the service manager, so I said no. So I trained a man to become, he asked me if I'd help mm -hmm. him become a service manager, which I did. And he wound up as the general manager of the Kerry Group, which mm. is the Kerry Ford, mm -hmm. Kerry Dodge, mm -hmm. and everything. So he was always thankful that I took the time to help him uh, diagnose engine auction noises and talk to customer about their problems and everything like that. Which, of course, Tom did. You preferred to be far. stay as a mechanic, the yes. hands-on person. And then one day, uh, my brother, my one brother, he was working at downtown Lincoln Mercury, and another was working for Covington Buick, and then he went in business for his own. He asked me if I'd like to go into business with him, 
And uh, I thought about it, and uh, we went into business. I became Shermer's Garage in Oakley, and uh, we uh, were in business for, uh, I retired, that was in 19, October of 59, we went in business together, and I retired in 84 because of health conditions. I had 47 years in the automotive business, including a time in the service. And the garage is still in business today. I sold out to my two brothers, and then my one brother, Frank, had half of the business. My mm -hmm. brother Vince had the other half. He sold out <coughs> to Vince. And right now, his uh, son, my nephew, is running the business. One of our mechanics has been there 40 years, another in 38, another in 33, 128. We had five mechanics. There was, there was two, two new ones in now that's helping out. So. There's seven, uh, seven mechanics. You stop that. by every once in a while. Oh yeah, I make sure by. that they stay. Well, not only that, there the way the cars have changed so much, I'd have to go back to school to learn how to work on, on the cars, not the mechanical part, but the electrical part, the computers and all. I would have to go back to school. So That's they do that for me. Of course, they're glad to do it. Sure. So I stop in once a month, maybe sooner if I want something checked. But it's still going in business, and uh, you're doing very well. Well, Joseph, thank you so much for coming and telling your story. It's, uh, it's well, really good to hear. I hope it's of interest to the people that may listen to it. And uh, I thank you very much for taking your time out to come here and help in this program. I'm um, volunteering because also I'm really... Also Robin Warner, the chief, I'm yeah, here to uh, help just out. Just because I'm so interested in hearing the stories, and, and I think it's so important that... Uh, they be recorded. These oral histories are just, just wonderful. But I also want to thank you very much for, the, for your service to the country. Well, thank you for that. I uh, really, really appreciate the contribution you made to keeping us all safe there. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, everyone has many more stories they could tell, but the time constraints and the importance of them, of course, is yeah. there. Well, thank you very much.